Hi everyone, my name is James Raganesi. I'm the Director of Engineering at Forge Nano, and today I'd like to talk with you about some of the engineering challenges associated with particle atomic layer deposition and some of the scaling challenges and solutions that we've come up with. All right, thanks for stopping by at the Forge Nano Engineering presentation for the PALD Summit. As you just saw in the video, I'm going to be taking you through some of the challenges and some of the solutions for engineering ALD systems on particles. All right, to start out for today, I'm gonna to kind of split the agenda between our lab systems and our commercial systems. For our lab systems, this is what tends to get the bulk of our scientists time. Uh, they use it as a platform system. There's a lot of different capabilities and we're frequently creating or adding customizations. And when we say lab system, we're usually referring to a research system that can process materials on the scale of one milliliter to one liter of substrate or powder or material per day. On these systems, I'll discuss some of the general design considerations when you're building them, uh, methods for controlling the system, and reactor shapes and sizes, as well as integration into some other lab systems that we'll show you. For our commercial systems, they tend to get the bulk of our large tolling orders and provide a great means for us to scale up a lot of the research that we're doing at Forge Nano. And when I say commercial systems, I'm really referring to systems that might process anywhere from one liter to a thousand liters of substrate per day. On these systems, I'll discuss obtaining economic throughput, handling bulk materials, so how do you handle them coming in and out of the door, vaporization of large quantities of precursor, and of course the actual commercial processing of those materials. And I'm sure as we go along, you'll probably develop a few questions of your own that you might want to ask. Uh, feel free to shoot me an email, connect with me on LinkedIn, whatever you're comfortable doing. I'm happy to discuss it with you further. Okay, most of the research systems at Forge Nano use a fluidized bed reactor setup to perform ALD. Most of you have probably seen something similar set up before, but the general premise is that you're going to be taking N2 or an inert gas you're going to flow that through a manifold at a fixed speed. It's going to enter a reactor that's housing your powdered materials or your target substrate. And those materials are going to begin to fluidize or become suspended within the traveling N2 gas. Once that's done, you can start to release vapor from your precursor into the same manifold and that's gonna become entrained within the N2. It's gonna make its way to these particles and you're gonna have the opportunity to begin performing an ALD reaction. Typical setups will have, you know, another precursor on here so that you can start switching back and forth and you can create lots of different configurations and lots of different ways of performing ALD. To add more granularity to the process, you would attach mass flow controllers like the one you see here, maybe a needle valve to kind of choke this precursor flow and control that, pressure transducers, a residual gas analyzer, things that can give you insight into the process. So that's our general design philosophy for the systems that we have here at Forge Nano. So minimum fluidization is going to be your ideal operating regime for powders, but you'll probably find that most powders aren't going to do this easily. Many powders are going to be too small and cohesive to fluidize easily. So what our engineering team does is fabricate these clear glass reactors for our scientists. And that allows them to kind of fully vet out and characterize the fluidization properties of a challenging powder, say. And when you have more consistent fluidization, you'll find that your reactions happen faster and more repeatedly. You'll also find that your precursor usage is probably going to be a lot more efficient. So why don't I go to an example of that right now? So we can see that kind of very light boiling action that these powders are exhibiting when they're at a nice fluidization regime. So here you can see the research system that the engineering team designs and builds for the research team. We call this our Prometheus system. It comes with a lot of different features and modules that you can both add or remove to the system that really makes it a highly adaptable system. We also have it as a commercially available system for customers who are looking for, say, a turnkey ready ALD system for particles. And I stress adaptability because we don't want a situation where, like you can see in the photo on the right, where we've had to move a lot of valving around and the system is constantly in flux or evolution and it starts to become very difficult to troubleshoot 
and you start to have issues getting repeatable results. And we find that adaptability really starts with the control system. So that's what I'll take you to now. So a challenge from an engineering perspective is to give our scientists a lot of flexibility in how their system is set up, specifically their control system. So we've given them kind of a flexible sandbox to work in where they can add and remove various controls, temperature monitoring, analog sensors, and things of that nature to sort of provide them with a constantly evolving system but something that we can keep under control and keep safe. Uh, we try to keep this as clean as possible, even though it's an ever-changing type environment. So as you just saw with the CREO, we also have a LabVIEW VI, and it's a GUI that allows us to generate recipes. And our goal with these recipes is to minimize the physical operation to just loading and unloading of powders. We strive to make everything else automated by the user. So on this screen, we have our recipe building interface. And users can control the state of the valves, the temperatures, the MFCs, all on this interface here. And then they can save that state as a single step in the recipe. They can name that step, and they can choose triggers or events or timers that begin and end that step. So say for five seconds, I want to hold two, two valves open. And then my next step is to hold a different valve open until the pressure reaches 100 torr. They can generate all these recipes right here on their laptop. They can then execute that as a CSV and send it over to the system at their leisure and import that and begin the run that way. So although ALD is kind of the obvious thing that you're going to generate these recipes for, we also have recipes for figuring out minimum fluidization, ramping up heating or ramping down heating, annealing, and other auxiliary processes that can benefit from automation. And continuing with the theme of adaptability, we also equip our systems with a pneumatic relay bank. And this gives really granular or fine control of the valve system to the end user. The user can add pneumatic lines for valves, pistons, impactors, motors, they can build new manifolds, put those together, add them to the system kind of whenever they need them. And then they just use the recipe builder to decide which ports are active, when they want the valves or the relays in this case to be held open. And then we also provide them with an interlocking interface so that they can prevent, let's say, unsafe conditions. So if there's two valves that they really wanna make sure can't be opened at the same time, even by accident, you can program in those interlocks very easily as well. So we like to have this feature as sort of a midway point between adding lots of system adaptability, but also being able to maintain a safe system environment. Okay, and now of course we have our fluidized bed reactors. Our typical design rule of thumb is to not let the total bed height, so just kind of how far the resting bed of the powder is going to be, we don't want that to exceed two thirds of this straight section here called the bed zone. We try to prevent that so that as you start to fluidize the powders, they don't get up into this expansion zone where the gas velocity is starting to slow down. We find that this just lends itself to inconsistent fluidization when you fill it that far. We also have this disengagement zone where you really want the gas velocity to slow down and all the powders to begin falling down because otherwise they're gonna catch on these filters here, which you're going to need in order to pull an aggressive vacuum without pulling a bunch of powder into the vacuum system itself. The system is usually built using conflat flanges. Conflat flanges lend themselves to having good vacuum capability, but also a lot of good high temperature capability, which you'll find that you'll probably are gonna to want to have as an option for your ALD process. If you're really interested in learning more about fluidization of different powders like this, I recommend reading up on Geldar classes, and that will give you more information about what powders are going to fluidize easily and how to design your reactors. So for our research in lab systems, we find that when we use a common CF flange size here, we're going to have a lot more usability than if all of the reactor types are unique. The reason for that is that the mounting plate doesn't have to be exchanged every time you want to disengage a reactor and swap it in for something else. So although this reactor on the left here looks a little goofy, 
it allows us to take one system and have a range of, let's say this is, this is about a five milliliter reactor all the way up to a one liter reactor, all on the same system, all within the same environment. And I'll show you a video of that now. For ease of use on our fluidized bed tools, one of the things that the engineering team likes to do is provide common flanging across all our reactor sizes. That allows our scientists to take a 10 milliliter reactor, such as this one, quickly attach it to the system, maybe do an ALD run, and then remove this reactor and add something much larger, say like a one liter reactor, and then quickly attach it to the same system with minimum amount of wrenching or reassembly of the system. So the last thing I'd like to discuss about our research systems is integration into glove boxes. In both these scenarios, we've flanged a reactor onto the exterior of a glove box. So what the user is allowed to do is perform some sort of pre or post treatment of their substrate within the glove box, load it into the ALD reactor system, do the process, and then unload it from the ALD reactor system into the glove box and you know maintain an inert environment the entire time and then we always provide a leak tight lid that can be attached to the reactor here and then you can remove this reactor if you need some kind of service or some other treatment that has to happen with the glove box okay that concludes our talk about lab systems you probably noticed that the focus for those lab systems was mostly on adaptability and ease of use now that we're moving on to commercial systems, the focus will really change more towards safety, cost efficiency, and throughput efficiency. So when we're talking about commercial scaling and things like that, we're usually looking to do something called spatial ALD. This is different than your typical batch ALD, where you're going to have pump and purge of precursor through a single chamber, and your substrate's just going to remain in that chamber throughout the process. With spatial ALD, you're actually going to allow the substrate to move through different precursor zones. This technique actually removes vacuum purging from your throughput calculation and allows you to operate in more of a, call it continuous ALD or continuous processing mode. So I've sort of mocked up what a spatial ALD process could look like. What the gray represents here is powder that's getting ready to be processed. And then in each chamber, reactor, whatever you want to call it, we've got different precursors pre-charged into each reactor. So this could be your precursor A, precursor B, back to A, back to B. And these will be isolated either through some sort of inert gas or through valving. When you're ready to begin the process, you would allow this substrate to move through these different zones and undergo the ALD reaction as it's traveling through. Once this powder is moving through the system, you can reload this pot again and begin processing more powder. And then you're going to end up with sort of a more of a cyclical or uh, continuous system here. And that allows us to really reduce the uh, overall cost of operations as well as increase the throughput. So, some new challenges that we're going to face now is how do we deal with these large quantities of material? We're talking about tonnage of powder now instead of a few grams of powder. And then how do we deal with the large quantities of precursor that we're going to be using? Because as many of you probably know, most ALD precursors have a lot of hazards associated with them. And now we're adding you know, a substantial amount of precursor to our everyday use. So first we'll talk about the handling of these large quantities of powder. So when you're receiving, let's say, tonnage of powder, you're usually going to be receiving them in a super sack or a bulk bag. That's kind of the industry term for it. I have some images of them below here. Usually these are about one cubic yard and they have these loops here, which can be looped into a hoist or a forklift. This material is usually like a, po a woven polypropylene. It feels kind of like a heavy duty tarp that you might buy at a big box store. And typically there's an inner liner here that's actually sealed and that's what's protecting the uh, raw material from 
the shipping environment. So especially if you're shipping freight or you're shipping on a boat or something like that, you wanna make sure that that material is sealed and not exposed to that type of atmosphere. So what Forge Nano actually does is integrate what you would maybe refer to as standard bulk handling methods into their ALD process. And I'll show you that next. So at this point, we have some images of Forge Nano's, I guess call it shipping and receiving type of process. On the left here, this would be sort of how we receive a bulk bag. So either the bulk bag is already sitting on a storage shelf, or maybe we just received it off of a truck. A forklift would then bring that bulk bag over to this framework here. And this yellow arm here is the end of a hoist. You would then lower that hoist and attach the loops to these different arms. You would then raise the bulk bag up and you can attach that bulk bag. You can't see it very well here, but there's a, a sort of a cone attachment and you're able to attach the inner liner and seal it against this cone. And that allows us to uh, inertly handle whatever material it is that we're receiving. At that point, we can empty the bulk bag into this cone and it's going to be pneumatically conveyed. So when I say pneumatically conveyed, uh, I'm talking about almost a giant vacuum cleaner that has a long hose here that's attached to the bottom of the cone. And that will then move the material up and into this giant hopper here. This hopper is under an end tube blanket. So now we can store this material in a safe operating environment that's not going to be contaminated by the atmosphere or anything like that. At this point, we can actually batch out small quantities of material. We have a little rotary mechanism on here. And then we can pneumatically convey that to different areas of the facility if we want to operate in small quantities or we can unload the entire bulk bag of material into one of our larger commercial processes. So this can actually allow us to distribute materials throughout the facility. When materials are finished, we once again can pneumatically convey them and we have a sieve or a commercial screening system here. And that allows us to break down any, uh, if you had agglomeration or if there was any contaminants in, this, in the material, that would allow us to capture it here and then that material is going to fall through the system here, the finished goods. And in this scenario, we have a glove box. And what we're going to be doing here is actually uh, batching this out into small bags so that we can distribute the material to multiple uh, destinations. Uh, another scenario would be that you could actually attach your bulk bag here. You can attach the inner liner to this outlet cone and you can fill an entire bulk bag, seal it, and then ship it off as a bulk good. So we have either option that we've developed here at Forge Nano, and that's kind of our way of dealing with the large quantities of, of material. Okay, let's discuss a bit on handling large quantities of precursor. On lab systems, it's fairly typical to directly heat the bubbler or container that your precursor is in, and induce vaporization that way. But when you get to commercial systems, that would mean heating a much larger quantity of precursors, say like 50 liters. And there are safety implications to doing that. You might also degrade that precursor depending on what temperature you're heating it to and for how long. So for that reason, you don't really wanna heat those large quantities of precursor. Now you might be able to incorporate a sort of a commercial vaporizer, call it off the shelf, that is typically used in semiconductor ALD or semiconductor CVD. The only issue that we run into with those is they tend to run very, very dilute. So you have a small quantity of precursor mixed in with your carrier gas. Powders have a much higher surface area than flats that you might encounter in the semiconductor industry. So we're gonna spend a lot longer running through an ALD process because it's so dilute and that really affects the throughput. So what we do at Forge Nano or what we would recommend here is to incorporate, say, a liquid flow meter or a liquid uh, flow controller to dispense really, really precise quantities of precursor and then run that through your vaporization process. So we might refer to that as like a, a direct injection process. We'd also recommend attaching a nozzle at the outlet of your direct injection so that you can aerosolize the liquid as best you can, and that will really put you in a better uh, position to do vaporization. 
So I'll try to show you an example of that right now. We have this mocked up. This is just the outlet of our dispenser with a nozzle on it, and we're just uh, dispensing water right now. Looks like it's going to play in the frame. Okay, so the water just got dispensed through the nozzle, and you can see what looks like steam. It's really just aerosolized water, but because the nozzle is so fine, we're able to get really, really small micro droplets, and that puts us in a much better position to vaporize that precursor. Okay. Okay, let's finally get into the commercial processing of these powders. So we've managed to unload the powders, we know how to vaporize our precursors, we're actually ready to perform the ALD. So how do we do that in a way that's fast and cost effective? So here I'll be showing you an atmospheric application of spatial ALD. This is for uh, ALD processes that don't really require a vacuum and that just need an inert environment in order to undergo deposition. So what you'll notice here is that we're going to have a bed of powder that's going to be traveling along, call it a conveyor, and you're going to have gas that's coming out from the bottom of this conveyor into the different zones. So the first zone being N2, then we'll be running our precursor A, N2 blanket again, and then precursor B, and we can just continue that trend throughout the entire process. So I have an example of what that might look like here, where we're going to load this material into a hopper and then unload it into our conveyor here for the actual ALD process. Okay, so I have a quick video here so you can see how this process actually looks so that you can visualize the powder bed traveling through the different zones. In this scenario, we have a uh, powder bed of cathode materials and we're going to drop some white talc powder on there so that you can kind of visualize the bed moving. So let me start that. So that talc is going to drop in just a second here. And there it goes. And now you can actually see the bed traveling and it's going to hit the first precursor zone here in just a second. And there it goes. That was the first zone right there. And you can kind of see the little bit of mixing that took place. It's about to hit the second zone. And you can see that this is moving at a, at a really decent clip. We've already gone through one full ALD zone. So our throughput is really regulated by the bed speed, so how fast this bed is moving through the different systems, and then how wide this bed is, and of course how high this bed is. So this bed is actually fairly shallow here. It's probably not much more than a quarter inch to a half inch high. But as we increase those numbers, we can directly increase the throughput. And then the number of ALD cycles that you can perform is really just limited by the length of this conveyor system. You could also consider doing a recycle loop if you want to just double the amount of cycles. You could do it that way. Or if your footprint is limited, perhaps you would just combine two of these in parallel. All right, well, now that you've seen the powder traveling through the system and kind of have a feel for how the system operates, I want to sort of zoom in here and focus on the reactive zone or the deposition zone. So, okay, good, the video started. And over here, we can see the actual reactive zone and you can see the gases penetrating through the powder bed. It almost looks like a fluidization is occurring here. So in order to accomplish this, we have to sort of optimize for each powder that we're going to use. So we might have to adjust the gas velocity here. We might have to adjust the bed height. It just depends on the powder properties. And once we've optimized it, we can kind of plug and go and run materials very, very quickly. Additionally, we can take other measures to deal with or, sorry, substrates that are less reactive or precursors that are less reactive. So in order to deal with that, we will slow down the bed height and we will allow the residence time to be increased for the powders in these reactive zones. And that will just maximize the amount of time that the powder has to react with the precursor and maximize your chances of having 100% ALD coverage. Additionally, we can even lengthen, physically lengthen these zones if we need to really increase that duration. We can also adjust things like gas velocity. I already mentioned bed height. 
uh, bed width and things of that nature in order to play with the throughput and optimize even further uh, if there's really a powder that we're trying to hone in on. So that kind of concludes our commercial processing section. That does conclude the content of the presentation. Thank you all for listening and I hope that you found the presentation useful. Once again, if you do have any questions, comments, or you just want to chat, shoot me an email. Uh, it was a pleasure presenting. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of the summit.